Hello, and welcome to Powerful Protest. This event is part of the inaugural Sussex Festival of Ideas, a dynamic and engaging program of talks, events, and activities. The festival is produced by the newly formed School of Media, Art, and Humanities at the University of Sussex. Some light housekeeping. This event is being recorded and will be posted on our website after the festival's end. Live captioning is available and can be activated by pressing the live transcript button on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Please feel free to use the Q&A panel throughout today's session. That's also located at the bottom of your screen and we will respond to your questions during the Q&A portions of today's event. And finally, a legal requirement, a member of the festival's team might contact webinar attendees for their feedback after the event. If you do not wish to be contacted, please email the festival's producer or a mem member of the festival's team to opt out of these communications. And you can find out about the festival team on our website under the About Us section. I'm now gonna hand over to Dr. Arlene Holmes Henderson, Senior Research Fellow at Sussex, who is the chair of today's event. Arlene? Thank you. And thank you so much everyone for joining us today for Powerful Protest. How does language enhance activism? We've got a fabulous panel of experts with us today to discuss this topic. I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves now. Sarah? I'm uh, Sarah Vestin. I work as a uh, lecturer in social psychology at University of Salford. Uh, my area of expertise is protest participation. So what goes on in a protest from a participation perspective. Fabulous, thank you. Chris? Hello everyone, I'm uh, Chris Warne. I'm in the History Department at the University of Sussex. Uh, I'm a historian of contemporary Europe uh, with a special interest in popular experience, popular culture, subcultures, and youth cultures. And lately I've been responsible for coordinating the Resistance Studies Network at Sussex, and in particular the development of an archive of resistance testimony at The Keep, which is an archive located right next to the university. Hello, um, I'm Stephen Coleman. I'm Professor of Political Communication at the University of Leeds. But I'm also working on the Speaking Citizens uh, research project, which is led by Sussex. I'm um, My most recent book that might be relevant to today is called How People Talk About Politics. Thank you. And Margareta? Hello, um, my name is Margareta Jolly. I'm a professor of cultural studies at the University of Sussex. I'm also director of the Centre for Life History and Life Writing Research, and that probably describes many of my interests. Wonderful. So you've heard a little bit about our panel and you're going to be hearing a lot more from them later. I'm going to start by sharing a few slides. Um, Stephen mentioned the Speaking Citizens project. That's the project that I work on at Sussex. And this project brings, to, brings together educators and researchers to promote citizenship education through talk. And you can visit our website at speakingcitizens.org. Now, we understand that a lot of you today who are watching will probably want to engage with our presentation and our conversation through social media. So I want to take a little time just now to help you understand how to do that. There is a hashtag for today's event, and that is Sussex Festival of Ideas. The Speaking Citizenship, the Speaking Citizens Project has a Twitter handle that's at Speaking Sits. My Twitter handle is at Dr. Arlene H. H. Sarah, who you heard from, is at Swedish Protests. Chris, he explained that he uh, runs the Centre for, for Resistance Studies, is at Resist Studies. Margareta has a great Twitter handle, it's at Jolly Margareta. And Stephen can be uh, tagged at University Leeds. Sussex and the Arts and Humanities Research Council, who fund the Speaking Citizens Project, can be tagged, as you can see on the screen. So let me explain how the project how today's uh, webinar is going to go. We're going to split into two sessions. The first session, we're going to think about powerful protests. What is going on 
in a powerful protest. In our second session, we're going to think about what makes powerful protests challenging and difficult. At the end of the second session, there's going to be the opportunity to put your questions to the panelists. So the question feature is going to be open throughout and I would encourage you to put your questions in all the way through and I will pose your questions to the panelists at the end. So without further ado, let's launch right in. In just the last 12 months, there have been a number of public protests. Some which have attracted media attention include Black Lives Matter, anti-lockdown protests and Extinction Rebellion. Sarah, could you tell us about the language used in a recent protest? What did you find interesting about it? Ooh, so what I find really interesting about the language is that it tells us a lot about who we are. So about the identity of the protest. You know, what are we protesting against or for? Or if we just look at um, a very recent protest, let's see if I can share my screen, um, that I think most of you have heard about. So the Sarah Everard widget, for example. So in this protest, we can see that there's lots of placards, right? Containing language, but there's also lots of chants going on containing language. And if we look at these placards and if we listen to these chants, it will help us understand what we are about. And with we, I mean the protesters, of course. And it's also interesting because you can follow how the protest develops by looking at the language used. So in the Sarah Everard, for example, in the beginning, you had a lot of language focusing on safe night. But then things happened and it became more about anti-police, for example, anti-state. So for me, the language that is used tells us something about the collective identity. Did that kind of answer your question, Ali? Absolutely, yeah. And the change of language use over the um, period of time of a protest was very interesting. Thank you. Um, okay, so turning to Chris now, you work as a historian of resistance studies. What would you say is going on in the powerful protests that you've studied? Um, so really picking up on what Sarah was talking about in terms of the kind of micro-analysis of individual protests, I suppose the, the focus of uh, the project of the Archive of Resistance Testimony, it's obviously uh, its goal is to gather stories and testimonies from those who are involved in such protests, but it invites them to put those separate moments of involvement in movements for social change or in acts of resistance, to put it in a slightly broader perspective. Um, and I think approaching the history of uh, protest and resistance in this way is a, a, a spot that a couple of things that come forward from that, but a what's really central to that is the way that there is a relationship between protest and our capacity to tell meaningful stories. So the way that we tie together those separate events into a, a, a meaningful narrative to give shape to that experience in a noble context. And so obviously when we're asking people to reflect on their lives and often it's, it's people who are retired or are getting towards the end of their lives and looking back, um, what comes out of that process is the way that they put these separated actions, these distinct and separate moments in, in their life into a, a, a context, which is both about their own individual trajectory, their own individual biography and their own individual identities, but also really brings forward the social relations and the connections with others that allows them to live that life. So, and by definition, to even undertake those actions. So that, that there's this constant to and fro from the individual life to the social environment, which enabled that, them to live that life. Um, and therefore, the, the, what it comes across is from these individual stories, paradoxically, in a way, is the collective nature of protest. It's always about the collective nature of the action. 
But the second thing that's come forward is the way in which these testimonies underlie how the process of storytelling is in itself an essential part of protest and of resistance. So the ability that individuals and movements have to tell meaningful narratives that connect the past, the present and future of their action is actually a significant part of uh, their capacity to resist. I'm borrowing that phrase from Howard Cagle, who's a philosopher who's looked into uh, resistance and the meaning of resistance. So the capacity to resist is almost as if the first step in that is asserting presence and asserting our control of the story. We're taking over the power to tell our story as if that's the first step in, in, in protest in a way. And, and so I think overall I would, um, from my perspective of, of, of putting protests into a chain or into a, a story of individual lives, that's what the, the power to tell stories has really come across, I would say. Brilliant, thank you. So following up on that, um, Sarah, can you tell us a bit more then about the psychology of protest? Absolutely. I think um, relating to a lot of what Chris said, you know, talking about the social relations, right? So when I study protests, I focus mainly on two processes. So we have the relations within the group. And here, of course, it's important to know who we are, you know, and who is included in us. If, you know, just look at the hashtag Fridays for Future, you know, it started with one person in Sweden and is now including the whole world. So it tells us a lot about who we are. But it also changes. And I think when we talk about social relations, we need to kind of acknowledge the impact from other groups. In protests, this is most often the police. And what we see is that the relationship, often a conflictual relationship with an out group such as the police, first of all, it unifies us. So who we are, so we become a lot more united. So our social relations within the group is strengthened and we feel more empowered, you know, that we can achieve something together because we feel like we're part of something greater. But it also changes, you know, our relationship, of course, with the police and with the state as a whole. And if we go back to the Sarah Everard example, the events at Clapham, which were not managed really well by, by the Met Police. Um, we can see how after the incidents in Clapham, how the language changed. And after that, we had a lot more kill the bill and anti-police hashtags and lots of you know, shame chants going on. So the social relations both within the group and with other groups are really important in creating our collective identity. And this is, of course, also conveyed through the language. Excellent, thank you. And I imagine people who are watching have got lots more questions about the impact of protests on people's psychology and their behaviour. So this is just a reminder that the question and answer function is open. Please feel free to be putting your questions in there. So Chris, in your research, you hear about the impact of protest on people's lives. I wonder if you could give us a couple of examples now of resistance stories that stand out from the interviews that you've collected or been witness to. Yes, yeah, so I've got a couple of examples. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And actually, the first example really picks up on something that Sarah just said. So this is Paul von Bloom, who was really pitched into civil rights activism in the late 50s and early 60s in the United States and then led a life, a lifelong engagement with civil rights and justice activism. But he was it was because his parents were. Um, but, you know, they, their resistance was called into action almost by the, the KKK and their handing uh, or their attempts to run black residents out of their, their suburban neighbourhood in Levittown, uh, PA. In fact, uh, Paul's family paid quite a high cost for this resistance. But he, that was his moment of engagement, really, through a kind of a moment of pushing back against someone, uh, uh, an oppressive attempt to um, uh, run black residents out of their neighbourhood. He then focuses on 
uh, in his student years, he takes part in um, SNCC Student National Coordinating Committee uh, voter registration campaigns in, in the southern US, but particularly in Alabama and Georgia. But what struck me about the way he told his story was how he saw the role of history in this and how they put their, their specific action in this context of a longer tradition. So I'm going to hand it over to Paul to speak. I was already, uh, by the time I was 18 and 19, I, I was absolutely committed uh, to spending as much time as I could in anti-racist resistance. And we knew that. And I think we actually used the word resistance. Uh, it was by 1960 or 61 widely viewed as a resistance movement. Uh, and those of us uh, at that point had really begun reading the history uh, of uh, anti-racist resistance. We had read uh, the longer history. We knew uh, of uh, the uh, development of the NAACP at the turn of the 20th century. We knew of the linkage of the um, black movement with the black labor movement. We knew of the slave revolts uh, in the, um, the late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, and I must say, when I went to Atlanta, some of the young people with whom I uh, spoke and worked, they were extraordinarily steeped in black history. So uh, while they were committed to the... Um, the movement of the day, they came with an extraordinary historical consciousness they really knew it. So they were not just committed to this protest or that demonstration. They really had a sense of a much greater struggle uh, that they rooted. Uh, they, could, they knew who Nat Turner was. They knew who Denmark Vesey was. They knew about Frederick Douglass. And they saw themselves as the contemporary heirs of a much larger resistance tradition. They saw themselves as the new abolitionists. And uh, Howard Zinn, uh, who was teaching uh, at one of the historically black colleges um, in Atlanta, uh, he had written about that and was himself very um, significantly involved. Uh, there was an astonishing historical consciousness. And I think it's fair to say that that historical consciousness made it a resistance rather than a mere protest movement. That's, I think, an important distinction. So that, that's my first example. The tech, does the tech working OK, by the way? <laughs> I've got panicky about that. Um, the second example is uh, an, an activist from the uh, Prague Spring uh, in Czechoslovakia in 1968. And she um, talks about that in her interview, but also later she was involved in the Charter 77 um, movement, which is, uh, was a response to uh, the, the state oppressing a group of artists and musicians and was really essentially a legal campaign. And she talks about signing the Charter 77 document, which if you read it in terms of the language of protest, it's quite interesting because it's really very measured and very unrevolutionary. It's a legal document, essentially, that asserts the rights um, according to the Helsinki Accords that Czechoslovakia had signed in 1974. And uh, so it's very moderate and not really a revolutionary document at all. So what struck us was the contrast between signing this very understated document and the impact that it had on her. So I'm going to uh, share again and uh, you can hear what she has to say about that. Once they chucked me out of work anyway, I ran into one of the spokesperson, Laya Hedanek, and signed, and you signed a little paper, you just did this piece of paper. I agree with the Charter 77 Manifesto of 6th of January 1977, name, profession. And you read that. <laughs> and it was a wonderfully happy day for me. 
I felt liberated. I felt free. I felt human. I, oh, it was wonderful. From then on, there was no stopping me because the, 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 the wonderful thing about that particular resistance movement, I don't know if you can call it a resistance movement, that particular civil initiative, civic initiative, people's initiative, citizens' initiative, was that where you had three friends. You suddenly had 200. Where you had 10 good reliable friends. You suddenly had 150 friends you could rely on with your life. You met people you would never have met. Why should I meet a, a former Communist Party official, former foreign minister like Giri Haig? Why should I ever meet him? No reason. Many of them I knew, the writers and the philosophers and all that, but there were many I didn't. I didn't have had no particular reason to meet this or the other Catholic priest or or even some of the, the underground people, and uh, it was just wonderful. So the, 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 the sign of the document connects her to others, and it was a liberation. She's discovered friends she didn't know she had. It's that discovery of the collective through this act, a simple act of just writing a signature on a piece of card. Oh, that was struck me as a really important testimony of, of that relationship between the individual in the collective, even in the, with the most muted language of protest, I suppose. Thank you so much for sharing those examples. Two brilliant examples, Chris. Sarah, did you want to add one more example here? No, but I'm perfect. Uh, can I can I discuss? Sure. <laughs> I think so first of all, when we talk about protests, we usually just think about the actual physical rally or march, right? Signing a petition, that is also a collective act. It's a collective action. It's a protest, right? So, you know, that also counts. And I think also what's so fascinating through Chris's two examples, so they highlight the positivity they highlight how good it feels. And when we talk about protests, we, I mean, of course this comes a lot from media because we mainly see the violence. We see the fires, we see the shields and we see the batons, we see people get dragged away. That is such a small part of protest participation. So I think we often forget all the positives so in our research on how it impacts people's lives, most of the changes that people go through, most of the consequences are referred to as positive. So you get, for example, better self-esteem. Uh, I even have participants who get a reduction in their uh, arthritis pain. And you get this whole collective feeling of being part of something. And that comes mainly from being part of the in-group. So I think when we talk about protests, we have a tendency to only focus on the negative parts. And we kind of disregard all of these positive things as in Chris's examples. You know, the empowerment, the increase in, in self-confidence, all of those things. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's so much more than just the fires that we see in media. Thank you so much for highlighting those positive impacts of protest, Sarah. And people who are watching can definitely follow along on social media and engage with Sarah about that research using her Twitter, her Twitter handle at Swedish Protests. OK, as we bring this first session of the event to a close, I've got a question for Chris. What resources are available to members of the public who are interested in the history of resistance and in protest in particular? I'm going to be very quick because I'm conscious of time. Um, we've, I, there's growing interest in resistance studies. So there are research centres being set up and archives and so on. But actually the, the interest in life history has preceded that. So quite often you get archives that aren't about resistance that have a lot of resistance content. So two examples, the Imperial War Museum sand collection or sand archive 
has a lot of issues with resistance veterans as part of its wider history of military engagement. But you have to find them, you have to search them out. The second would be something like the South Africa Historical Archive, which has loads and loads of oral history material about the long str struggles for justice in South Africa, but it's more geographically focused and focused particularly on anti-apartheid. Um, so this is, you know, to blow our, my own trumpet, this is where the archive resistant testimony comes in because we want to draw our um, testimonies from across these different places. So we have World War II resistance, we have anti-apartheid resistance, we have anti-war resistance, uh, we have, we're just beginning to start with veterans of uh, resistance to dictatorship in Latin America, we have resistance in Eastern Europe during the Cold War, and we're trying to put them together in one place in a way that perhaps hasn't been done before. So I will post links to all those three archives I've mentioned in, in the chat so people can follow those up if they want. And there's a lot of um, material that is increasingly accessible online to the wider public as well as to researchers. That's fantastic. And I think those links will be really useful. And if people want to engage again on Twitter at Resist Studies is where they need to go. And the hashtag for today's event is Sussex Festival of Ideas. Okay, so we're going to move on now to the second session of today's event. Many people feel unsure about finding the right words and tone for protesting. What help can we offer them? I've asked Stephen and Margareta to begin to answer that question. So, starting with Stephen, how do we learn to protest? Well, Arlene, Oddly enough, people don't need to learn how to protest because every child is a natural protester. They possess three tremendously valuable characteristics. The first of them is emotional expressiveness, a, a kind of an unconscious capacity to cry, demand, cheer, laugh, make a scene. Terrifically useful in protest. Secondly, and I don't quite know what I mean by this phrase, but I think you will all know something about what I mean an innate sense of fairness. You know, you know, anyone who's worked with children knows that they kind of make very, very clear judgments about what's fair and what's unfair. And thirdly, communicative creativity. In other words, if children can't find the right word or phrase or story, they make one up and that's okay. Now, what happens as we approach adulthood is that we unlearn these skills. We forget how to protest. We become embarrassed, we become repressed, we become respectable. So developing the language of protest really entails recovering this basic insistence that our impulse to counter what is wrong should be acted upon. So I wanna show you my image. You asked us all to bring along an image and I, brought my one along and I think it sort of it says something um, rather nice um, um, he, 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 here's um, a child expressing themselves protest is not always about formulating clever arguments sometimes it's about communicating a shared feeling or just the fact that there is any feeling there at all, a sense that there's something to be said, even if the means of articulating it are not yet available. And I think it's really important that people understand that that sense of common feeling is itself the basis of solidarity and protest, and that one doesn't have to have all of the intellectual resources that are part of the standard repertoire. Brilliant, thank you. So Margareta, what are the obstacles that protesters have had to tackle? Thank you. I guess this is, this is the other side to what Stephen just said. So it's true, I mean, I love this this idea of there's an instinct actually of, of, of protest and of justice. Um, and I love some of the, the uh, zoological studies of when you give certain species of monkeys, only, you know, one gets lovely bananas and one gets the horrible old nuts or something. And they get really outraged, you know, that e even animals have a sense, I think, of fairness and justice. But on the other hand, I think I'm going to say that there are real, um, questions around <clears throat> how to how to 
to protest in a way that has political purchase. And I can see one of the questions is asking here, you, you know, is there a danger of a protest arms race almost with Extinction Rebellion? And I, I think it really is quite, there are, there are many, many um, obstacles in the way of doing it in a, in, you know, get, getting success, I suppose, from, for your aims. And the, the first one, before we even get to language is the right of assembly and freedom of speech itself. Um, guaranteed by the Human Rights Act 1998 in this country under the European Convention of Human Rights. Well, I've already raised a question there as Brexit rolls on. You know, that is that is currently the legal uh, umbrella that guarantees this, this right, which of course came out of the Second World War and, and the idea of human rights. Um, but we are in a time, as we all know, where autocracies seem to be flourishing, coming back. Um, I think it's really important we begin by protecting ideas of the freedom of assembly and the freedom to speak. But even when you've got the legal rights, there are many cultural challenges. <clears throat> and um, this is something that my own research was very, very much um, looking at. Um, I was I've been looking at uh, the women's liberation movements of the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And here there was mu much of the movement as a whole was developing from, well, 50 years ago, notionally, we, we got the, the right to vote. But actually, in practice, there are many cultural challenges. There are unevennesses in legal rights. So the cultural challenges are really important, too, to what prevents the, the finding a voice, if you like. So I thought I'd just share screen here with one image. Um, and I do have some more images, but I thought I'd start with this one. Uh, so this is Amrit Wilson, who is, um, was a, a really pioneering uh, sort of catalyst for British Asian women's uh, rights and the movement. Um, as well as also working with um, working class labor movements and many other movements. And she brought out this book in 1978, uh, Finding a Voice, Asian Women in Britain. And I, I chose that because it's this concept of finding a voice that is part of what is necessary to protest. And that is a really complex question. You know, what is a political voice? Um, it's, it's a cultural achievement as well as a legal achievement, if you like. Um, so, so you can see here, the cover of the book here has some women sort of shouting against the police. Um, resisting police violence has been really ongoing struggle within ethnic minorities in this country. Um, at that time, Asian women were also su subject to uh, immigration discrimination, including virginity tests at Heathrow Airport which, you know, just even saying that. Uh, there was the Grunick strike, legendary um, labor movement uh, strike led by um, Jaya Bin Desai. Anyway, all of these things were a part of this concept, I think, of gaining political voice. Um, and I wanted to say here, the, the picture on the right of Amrit Wilson, comes from this project, which I have the privilege of leading, which is an oral history of women across many different parts of women's movements at that, in that time. Um, this is at the British Library, and it, you could add it to your resource kit because there's 120 clips that you can listen to just by going on bl. Um, what is it? bl. Sister, bl. uk slash sisterhood. Um, uh, but you could also go to the library and hear the long life histories, which I strongly uh, agree with Chris, are, are vital to getting that bigger concept of how you find a voice. Um, but uh, I think there are elements here that, um, as we say about the, the law and about public space, about confidence. Um, and I want to show you one more example here of Una Kroll, who I also interviewed who was a key person in the movement for the ordination of women. Um, and she told a brilliant story, so I think very relevant to the, the physical question of <laughs> physically you have to find a voice too. Um, for women, this has been a long-standing question around public speaking. 
you know, the stereotype of at the wedding, who stands up to give the wedding speech? It's, it's always the, you know, it's the best man, not the best woman, or the best woman's terribly nervous anyway, <laughs> you know, because there are there are long-standing questions around public space. Um, and she takes us to the pulpit um, as a woman who wanted very, very much to be able to give the give sermons, to have full equality, to represent, to channel the voice of God even. Um, but uh, it was, uh, she, you know, women's, women were not allowed to do this at that time. And she talks in her oral history about a theology of women's bodies as being, it's not just women's voices are weak or they don't have charisma, but actually women's bodies are not clean enough to channel the voice of God. So she would do these kind of protest pulpits, unauthorized sermons while she was menstruating. And she talked about particularly when she could would, would give the Eucharist uh, while menstruating and what this complex act of, uh, you know, voice was was doing in actually connecting voice to a, th a reclaiming of the body as a whole, what, what the, the, vo the vocal cords are part of a body. And there is a question, of course, we all know women's, women's liberation is crucially about bodily rights and bodily autonomy and bodily inclusion. I just love that. I mean, it's a very complex kind of act there. But, you know, the Eucharist is when you're supposedly giving the, 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 the blood of Christ, you know. So why is when you, you actually can produce blood, which gives life, you know, why is that so you would think that would go together. Anyway, she she also tells about trying to get on the BBC's thought for the day and being told, well, can't women's voices are too too high. You know, the BBC would love you very, very clever, but I'm afraid the pitch is wrong. So she does pitch, pitch uh, training and I'll come on to some of those thoughts maybe when we get to what can you do? How can you, how can you improve your protest skills? So, um, well, that's a start. Many obstacles, but many ingenious ways of overcoming. Thank you for that overview of obstacles. And you mentioned there, Margareta, finding your voice. Stephen, um, how do people learn expressive confidence? Uh, with great difficulty, Arlene. Um, being a democratic citizen is actually bloody hard work. Uh, it involves more than following the news or paying taxes or putting a cross on a ballot paper every few years. It requires a certain amount of courage, the courage to move from private grumbling to public voice. And that, of course, involves everything from the physical finding of a voice that will be taken seriously to voice in its more metaphorical sense as uh, a way of making one's presence in the world felt. Now, many of the political silences in our history have arisen not from people having nothing to say, but from having no words available to say what is burning within them. So before they're able to assume their vital agenda setting roles, movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter had to articulate a response to injustice that overcame the prejudices of those who dismissed them as being oversensitive or over emotional or over demanding. So the right to speak requires confidence. And in my book, How People Talk About Politics, I argue for what I call a courageous democracy. And learning to have the courage to speak out or to act out without speaking, which is also important, is, in my view, best achieved through small acts. And I'd urge anyone listening or watching today to just perform one small act in the next 24 hours. Show someone that you agree that you're on their side. Show an act of solidarity with someone who you think deserves your support because they're doing the right thing. Show someone that you disagree with by showing that you have a different way of seeing things. And our democracy, I would argue, needs more ways of sharing those experiences of these small gestures 
of protest. And that's, I think, where confidence comes from. I mean, like Margaret, I've got some very specific suggestions to make about how people can make their voices heard and understood. But I think that this intangible quality of confidence is incremental. You don't have it and not have it. You don't not have it and then have it. You build it. And we need as a society to take the scores of confidence as seriously as we're going to be taking the scores in the Euros over the next few weeks. Great, thank you. So it's hard work and it's something that we need to build up to. And I think there could be some, there's already some questions about when is the best time to teach those skills. So we'll get to those later. Uh, okay, back, so back to Margareta, please. Um, what sort of training have protesters pursued? Could you give us an insight to some of your research on this, please? Um, well, there, there are lots of examples. Um, one of them uh, from the women's, the, the early resurgent women's movement, early 1970s, was to actually train in public speaking, which I've mentioned is, is a key kind of challenge for many women. Um, but they did it in a very idealistic and quite characteristic way of um, rotating who would be the press person or the, the spokesperson, I should say spokeswoman at that time, it, with the, the principle that the women's movement didn't have a leader and didn't have leadership and anyone could do anything. And it, it, this, is, this is partly inspired by, I think, socialist ideas of breaking down divisions of labor and hierarchies of labor. So everybody learns all the skills. Um, and this was true also of um, the very idealistic idea of um, printing your own material too and learning how to print, you know, and dist distribute it. Um, so all the, all the print workshops and um, many, many journals and newsletters and um, sort of flyers produced by the movement. And that's not only the women's movement at that time, and this is a familiar tactic today. But so training in, in public speaking, rotating who gets to speak. I will add, this is sometimes a very high ideal, and I did have examples. Ellen Malos was one person who I interviewed who said, it, you know, not everybody is as good at it or, or likes to do it as well. And she was once put on a panel with Jermaine Greer. And Jermaine Greer is probably the best known, quote, feminist of that time, partly because she is absolutely a genius at public speaking. She can do the humor, she can surprise, she's surrealist. She has a performance art aspect to her. But however, the, the funny thing was that she never really was part of the grassroots women's movement. And, and so the problem was she would, you know, there, there you've got the problem in a nutshell. If you don't get more professional about it, someone who is more professional might get the stage. And I think I'm, I'm looking at the time, I'm thinking I should try not to speak too long because I'm very aware of a question I would like us to consider, which is about right wing protests because I think you know the right the right have learned many many protest techniques from the left in the last 20 years I think that have built up to the current state of resurgent of the of the new right so many of these techniques and the feelings of inclusion and joy you know in collective singing and you know these these are these can be with any kind of protest it doesn't matter what the cause so this is a challenge if perhaps yeah, what do we do about that? Um, but so that's one thing. I Building on Stephen's point about starting with small acts, the Greenham Common Women's Peace Encampment, which was an anti-nuclear protest at the height of the Cold War in the 80s, had some rather lovely um, different ideas of training in that, in that kind of, um, repurposing a domestic culture, I think, and the maternalist culture that, that often drove women to protest literally for fear of, you know, my kids are gonna die in a nuclear war, which wasn't unlikely and still isn't unlikely, sadly. Well, I saw two things that they did that I thought were a lovely idea. One is setting up a little table and putting on it, can you stop for a talk? Now this table was outside a military base but 
just you know just that a similar one was an american willing to listen little table placard an american willing to listen very interesting very uh, yeah then i would i just want to pick out now the last lastly the question of training in writing or creating slogans and chants use it actually get to the words point getting back to language is it's obviously it's a little bit like the twitter demand how do you express it in three words um and here women against fundamentalism was a brilliant campaign which was led by south all black sisters in london but which allied with uh, uh, irish women and to put together different campaigns against religious fundamentalism that was built on patriarchal ideas of, of women. Um, so they had fear your weapon, courage ours. That they, you know, spent a long time thinking about that. I think this is one answer to the question of the right, who have incredibly effective uh, ta political tactic of demonize the other. Unfortunately, this really works and Trump has perfected it. That, you know, so let's try to, you know, I think the left always has a challenge because we're not stooping to that, that tactic. Fear your weapon, courage ours. Another one was our, tra our, tra our tradition, struggle, not submission. So reclaim the idea of the tradition as a radical tradition, speaks to Chris. Then I'll, I'll end with what I think has been the most um, su successful uh, or a one demonstratively impactful successful campaign which was summarized by women's rights are human rights and this actually started in the philippines um with the women's coalition led by uh, gabriella um under the third uh, marcos regime in the early 80s gains gains steam with training now here we have the opposite to the women's liberation movements anti-leadership thing in fact <laughs> by training in leadership skills, um, got it through to the Charlotte Bunch uh, feminist leadership um, uh, uh, organization in Washington, which then took it into the uh, Vienna Human Rights um, Convention in the early 90s, through to Hillary Clinton adopting the phrase in 1995 in Beijing. And the point is, the, the key idea is, gender-based violence is equivalent to military violence. It's equivalent to state violence. It's equally an equivalent abuse of human rights. But to be able to summarize it in women's rights are human rights for words and train around that and build it up on all the different levels from the outside in the street through to the lobbying in, in different governments. And that has really, you know, that's totally changed the way everyone understands it. And it's got massive legal protection now. Excellent, thank you so much for that um, really in-depth uh, overview of ways in which training has been pursued by various protesters in various regions of the world in the past. Um, I guess I would at this point say that the Speaking Citizens Project is looking at ways in which oracy education, that is education for effective communication and speaking and listening, is being used in schools and outside of schools and other settings um, around the UK currently. And we're working with the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Oracy and the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Political Literacy um, now and in the future to look more closely at how these skills are being cultivated um, for young people. So uh, if you're interested to find out more about that, you can visit our website at speakingcitizens.org. Okay, so to bring this session of the event to a close, I would just like to focus on practical things that people can do to make their voices heard and understood. Stephen and Margareta, what are your top tips? Well, I, I think I teach the only undergraduate course in the country which is on confident self-expression. Uh, and so I've been working with students for a number of years in terms of really trying to boil down some of these principles. And I'm going to put four out there for you. And I think that the first of these is about, and, and I think it, it, it resonates with what uh, Margareta was saying, it's about um, 
winning attention on the pace on the basis of a very clear point very often uh people go out to offer a message which is the culmination of a lifetime of thinking about something and they want that lifetime of thinking to be transmitted to everyone around them within seconds and one of the brilliant things about the take back control kind of slogan is that it condenses that lifetime in this case i would say lifetime resentment into something that is catchy and meaningful and frames what is going on so i think the first thing that i want to say is that before you start frame what it is you want people to know i think the second point is show don't tell that is to say i think that this is very much about stimulating people's imaginations rather than the traditional finger pointing of the oxbridge political tradition it, it's about showing people from your own experience from other people's experiences from their imagined experiences and if we don't do that then we are in danger of becoming didactic bores which so many people in politics of course are but so few realize the third thing and it relates to this first attention grabbing point is a clear takeaway um what do you end with what is your what is it you want people to do as a result of this and it's important to remember sarah will be interested in this something the psychologists call the recency effect people remember the last thing they heard much more than the first or the middle things that they've heard that's why the news reader at the end of the news every day always repeats the headline item because that's the item that you're going to remember an hour later and a lot of the others you will have forgotten and we need to remember that because if the last thing that you've said is you know anyone who needs to use the toilets are over there that's not your message and i think the final thing and i could talk about this one for a long time but you're going to know why it's so important the political voice is listening because listening and politics in the popular imagination are antithetical acts and whether it's professional politicians or indeed whether it's protesters the assumption is these guys don't listen they tell and there was a wonderful philosopher called martin buber who described listening in the following terms one being turning to another as another as this particular other being in order to communicate with it in a sphere which is common to them both but which reaches out beyond the special sphere of each and that's what listening is it's a recognition that the other person is another person but that we've each got to move out of that sphere of personal understanding if we are going to understand anything together or intersubjectively and i would argue that if we can work on developing those and the questions that we should come to are really important about where we do this we should be doing it in schools but as we've been learning in my section of the speaking citizens project people learn about this outside of school so we're working with young trade unionists we're working with graffiti artists we're working with people who outside of the traditional institutional setup are finding creative ways of doing these four things and i think that we need to incorporate them into what we mean by democratic politics thank you and margareta i i want to take that course with you stephen <laughs> uh, um improve my nine thousand pounds nine thousand pounds will get you in um uh, margareta okay uh, uh, sign up <laughs> i mean i i agree i think it's a really practical as well as thinking about the psychology and the emotions is crucial but also practical things so training in public speaking. Um, I think there's a question around pitch. Um, 
And I was fascinated that Naomi Wolf, who wrote, I think, The Beauty Myth, um, American feminist, has been doing training around up, up talk um, with young women um, who have adopted high rise terminals, if you know what I mean, every sentence ends in a question um, that seemingly came from Australia, but it actually has the effect in many places where political decisions are made uh, of, uh, of reducing authority. Also the vocal fry, creaky voice, it's apparently came from the Kardashians, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's like a little bit, I've seen it, I've done it, I'm a post-feminist, I'm not interested. <laughs> she says, this is not actually gonna get you very far politically. I feel, <laughs> I feel very, very strongly about this, but not everyone agrees with me. Commu creating a communication strategy. It's like, Stephen, what's your key message? Who are you trying to reach? What's the, what's the headline? Um, one, one point you can always hear it on the Today programme is you don't answer the question that was given to you, answer the audience you're trying to reach and then repeat that message. Um, something I would like to know more about is how to manage social media, um, which has changed the terms of protest. As someone schooled in going to Trafalgar Square and feeling uplifted and that somebody's put a question there, is protest better for your mental health than therapy? I would say definitely equal. Um, but um, social media has changed things and here I just want to shout out to Paxton Smith who last week used her high school graduation speech in Texas to talk about uh, the extreme crushing of reproductive rights in Texas that's happened under Trump's regime. And she had her three and a half minute high school speech. I, I can see the time, <laughs> but she used that absolutely classic public speaking rhetorical forum and she did it there to a very large audience. And then it went viral and somehow it's worked in both ways. And just to, just go and watch how she how she does it, and then how she talks to it in an intimate, informal way, and doubles the political impact. It's really inspiring. Wonderful, thank you. Well, Marquez has done a great job of answering a number of the questions which were uh, posed to our panelists on um, social media and um, on the arms race. Um, unfortunately, we have not been able to answer all of the questions, but I'm going to share my uh, screen again so that you can see again the Twitter handles of our various panellists. And so you have the opportunity to follow up again and direct your questions directly to our panellists if you want to follow up afterwards. Uh, if you are interested in any of the research that our panelists have talked about or any of the links that they mentioned, this is how you can contact them. Again, you can uh, talk about today's event using the hashtag Sussex Festival of Ideas. And so lastly, I would just like to thank our panelists, Chris, Sarah, Stephen and Margareta very much for uh, contributing to powerful protests how it does language enhance activism. And I would like to thank all of you for attending and watching today and enjoy the rest of the events that are part of Sussex's inaugural Festival of Ideas. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for great questions. <laughs>